All right. Thank you, praise team. Man, that was so good. Good to see everybody this morning. Man, it seems like it's been a, a while since I've been up here able to preach nearly a If you have a Bible with you, why don't you open up to Matthew chapter 11. Today we're going to be looking at a text that I believe is extremely relevant for us today. I mean, we all know that all of the Bible is timeless. It's all relevant. It all applies. But um, what we're looking at today, I think, is especially needed. I mean, let me just ask you. I mean, how many of you would say that you could use some good rest? And I don't mean just physical rest. Even more than that, I'm talking about mental, emotional rest, rest from stress. How many of you would like that? Yeah, that, uh, I thought so. Because people right now, particularly in the United States, and I'm sure it's just the same in other parts of the world too, we are more stressed out than we have ever been. I, I read a, a study that was done. The study was done about 10 years ago, and so the numbers have, have nearly doubled since then. But just 10 years ago, this study found that 45% of Americans say that they lie awake at night, finding it hard to sleep just because their mind is racing and so many things that they're stressed out about that they're, they're thinking of. 36% report feeling nervous and anxious. 35% report anger and irritability, uh, easily set off and, and impatient. 34% fatigue due to the weight of stress that they're always carrying around. And for the younger generation, the numbers are even higher. The American Psychological Association sponsored a major study of Gen Z, which are all those that were born in or after 1997. And it found that 81% of Gen Zers say that they are stressed out about money. 77% stressed about work. 73% about violence and something catastrophic happening. And the list just goes on and on and on about the things that the younger generation says that they are stressed about. Health experts are concerned about the significant increase in, in all the, the medication that is being taken to, to, to try to alleviate these things. And why are they concerned? Because the number of prescriptions that are being written for dealing with things like stress and anxiety and depression has tripled over the last decade. Tripled. They're now saying that we are in an anxiety epidemic in this country. We're stressed out and in need of rest. For those of you who can relate and you say, yeah, that, that's me. I'm pretty stressed out. The good news is you don't have to live that way forever. You can find rest of mind, rest of soul, and Jesus is going to show us how in this text this morning. And what's really good about it is that in order to eliminate the stress, it doesn't mean you have to eliminate all the things that cause you stress. The kind of rest that he offers is a rest even in the midst of what would be considered stressful situations. So let's look at the answer for living a stress-free life today. Is that even possible? Well, Jesus believes that it is. So let's look at this. Matthew 11, I'm going to ask you to stand uh, in honor of God's word, starting in verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Let's pray. God, I'm so grateful for your word this morning. And Lord, we know it is true. We know it is powerful. God, I pray that you would uh, display the power of your word. Lord, not the eloquence of my speaking or anything like that, but the power of your word. And Lord, you are a big God, so I'm going to ask for big things. Things like 
complete transformation, things like um, this being a defining moment in somebody's life today. Lord, I'm even praying for salvation, that those who don't know you that may be in here today will come to know you today. And so, God, I'm just asking you to have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Nothing in this world happens just by random chance. God is a God of order, design, and purpose. And he has ordered and designed everything to work according to certain laws and principles. The main one being the law of cause and effect. That means nothing happens just out of thin air without there being a reason for it. There is always a cause that produces some other effect. And I know that most of us know that that's how the world works. This is nothing new that I'm saying. But there is one area that I think that we either uh, forget about that or, or don't believe it applies, and that is to the area of the Christian life. So here's what I mean by that. I mean, we know that as Christians, there are things that are, we're supposed to be uh, walking in and experiencing things that are available to us like like joy and peace and faith and even the rest that Jesus says that he offers here. But how exactly do we experience those things? It seems that many of us just kind of expect those things to fall on us like rain from the sky. It's like we assume that since we are in Christ, we should just automatically be experiencing and walking in all of those things and so when we aren't experiencing those things when we aren't living the abundant life that Jesus said that he came to give now we think that there's something wrong with us which just gives us one more thing to be stressed about and some people are even doubting their salvation whether or not they're really saved because they're not really living in any of these things that are supposed to be available to Christians but the truth is, those things don't just fall on us from the sky like rain. And rain would be a bad analogy because rain itself doesn't just appear out of nowhere. There are things that happened, had to happen in the atmosphere in order for the effect of rain to appear. And the same is true for rest. And here in this passage, Jesus is going to tell us how to get it. Think of it like a cake. I mean, we all know that a delicious cake just doesn't appear out of thin air. Somebody had to put the right ingredients together in just the right way. Putting those ingredients together, putting that in the oven, turning the oven on, that was the cause that produced the effect of a delicious cake. The same is true for rest. And Jesus in this text is going to give us the ingredients, the cause for us to experience the effect of rest. And the first thing he says is the main ingredient. Without this one, none of the others would even be possible. There in verse 28, he says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. The first thing we have to do to find and experience rest is to turn to Jesus for it. Now, I know that seems like that should be a no-brainer, especially for, for Christians. But apparently it's not because there are so many of us Christians who are turning to things other than Jesus in order to alleviate the stress that we are dealing with. I know there's many of you even in this room right here this morning or listening online, you're turning to things like alcohol, thinking that that buzz is going to alleviate the stress. Some of you are just spending hours and hours just playing video games just to get your mind off of those things that are causing you stress for the moment. Some deal with stress just by going to bed and pulling the covers over their head, thinking that they can just sleep off the stress. All sorts of things that we turn to other than Jesus. And so my question would be for you, how is that working for you? Because I would bet that it's probably not working out very well and the stress is no less than it is without you doing those things. Though so it might make you forget some of it for a moment, but once the buzz goes away, once the video game is over, once you get out of bed, that same stress is there for you to deal with again. 
And listen, I'm not judging anyone or trying to make it sound like I'm better than anybody else in this because there are things that I have a tendency to turn to other than Jesus when I'm feeling stressed. You know what my main outlet for that is? Work. I will busy myself with all kinds of work when I'm feeling stressed. If there's dishes piled up in the kitchen, I'll go do that. I'll go mow the yard. I'll go out in my shop and find something to do. Now, that doesn't mean that every time I work, it means I'm stressed. But if I am stressed, you'll usually find me doing something busy. I mean, even if I've got all the work done and there's nothing left to do, if I'm stressed, I'm going to go find something to do. I guess that's the only good thing about having a yard full of bahia. (laughs) I mowed yesterday, and I promise you I could go out there and mow it again today because it grows so fast. And so that's something that I have a tendency to turn to other than Jesus but when we do that I mean those things aren't really the remedy they're band-aids at best and a placebo at worst band-aids because they just might cover up the stress for a little bit but they don't alleviate it completely a placebo the placebo effect believing that something is working when it actually isn't and the more that we do that the more we go down that slippery slope that leads to dependence and addiction Jesus didn't say, come out to the field, come to the TV, come to the liquor store, come to bed. He said, come to me. Come to me if you're weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, it's very important to know that we can't just stop there with verse 28. If we stop with verse 28, we could easily assume that rest is something that Jesus is just immediately going to give us the moment that we turn to him. And this is another example of why context is so important, how I'm always telling you, be careful of just pulling one verse out of a passage without taking all the verses around it into consideration. Rest is not something that you can just give someone any more than you can give someone laughter. I mean, you can do something that would cause laughter, but you can't just say, here, here's some laughter. Just like you can't give pain to someone, but you can cause pain. You can't give pleasure, but you can do something that would cause the effect of pleasure in someone else. And the same is true with rest. And we know this is true if we keep reading just the next verse. He says there in verse 29, Take my yoke of... If you're following along in the notes there, the first one is this. Rest is not something to be given. It's something to be learned. Learning rest is a process. It's not something that one suddenly discovers like finding a hidden treasure It's something that comes more slowly, the way that one would find knowledge. Nobody receives a lot of knowledge all at once. It's gained, it's learned slowly over time. And the same is true for this kind of rest. Learning rest is part of our growth process, part of our sanctification. I mean, those of you who who tend to garden every year, you know that in order to produce a good harvest, you have to create the ideal environment for those plants to flourish. You can't just throw a seed on the ground and hope for the best. But I think that's exactly the way that many of us approach the Christian life. We just kind of throw out a prayer and hope for the best. Lord, take my stress away. Lord, quiet my mind and hope that that just miraculously happens all of a sudden. But you can't just throw out a prayer and hope for the best any more than you can just throw out a tomato seed and hope for a a good harvest of tomatoes in a couple of months. You have to prepare the soil. You have to create the right environment for that to happen. And the same is true for rest. It is a cause and effect. And so when Jesus said, come to me and I will give you rest, he wasn't saying he would just immediately give it right then. What he really meant was that he will put us in the way of rest. He will teach us how to learn to rest. It means he would give us the ingredients for it and teach us how to create the right environment for rest to flourish. One of the causes, one of the ingredients for it, he gives right there. Before he said, learn from me, he said, take my yoke 
upon you. If you want to find rest, you have to take Jesus' yoke. What exactly does that mean? Well, Jesus intended for it to have a double meaning here. The first meaning is the most obvious one. We know that a, a yoke is a, a, a wooden harness type thing that went over an animal's neck that was used for it to pull or, or carry a heavy load. But that doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? And the wearing a yoke doesn't sound like rest. That sounds like work. Sounds like the exact opposite of rest. Well, it does if you don't understand what the ultimate purpose of a yoke is. A yoke was made, the whole purpose of it was to lighten the load for that animal. It enabled the weight to be distributed in such a way that it wasn't near as, as heavy as if it, if, if it would have been if it hadn't had the, the yoke. And it enabled it to pull it for, for longer uh, periods of time. To attach an animal in any other way to a wagon or a plow or anything else without a yoke the weight would be too much to bear, and they wouldn't be able to work for very long, but the yoke is what made the work easier, and they could last a lot longer. A yoke was not an instrument of torture, but an instrument of mercy. It was not meant to cause pain, but to alleviate pain. The other meaning that Jesus intended for using the analogy of a yoke had to do with Jewish culture back then. In the Jewish religion, each rabbi had his own interpretation of the Torah, the Old Covenant law, and would teach his, his students how to apply it. For example, there was the law that you couldn't work on the Sabbath day. Well, that's pretty vague. And so what does it mean to work? What is considered work and what's not work? And so each rabbi would interpret that. And some rabbis had a very strict interpretation and others had a, a more loose interpretation. Each rabbi's interpretation and application of the law was called that rabbi's yoke. In Galatians 5.1, Paul is writing the letter to the Galatians, warning them on believing that you've got to go back and follow the old covenant law in order to remain saved. And he said, Jesus has set you free from the law. Therefore, do not be subject to a yoke of slavery all over again. And so Paul said that following the law was being bound to the yoke of slavery. It's that kind of yoke of a rabbi that he was referring to. Each rabbi back then also had a group of disciples, just like Jesus did. And those disciples would devote themselves to learning the teaching, learning the ways of that particular rabbi. And those disciples were said to be under that rabbi's yoke, under his way of teaching and living life. And so to follow and apply a rabbi's yoke meant learning how to live the way that he did, the way that he taught. And so Jesus is saying here, learn how to live by following me, by, by watching me. And so the next point there, when he said, take my yoke, he was saying, take my way of living. Take my way of living. Now it's important to note that nowhere in here does Jesus indicate that doing that, that taking his yoke, that living life his way means that life is going to be a lot easier. Taking his yoke, doing it his way does not mean that bad things aren't going to happen, that suffering won't come, that, that life itself wouldn't be a burden. No, we still live in a broken world, and the brokenness of it means that life is going to be a heavy load that every one of us are going to have to pull from the cradle all the way to the grave. What Jesus is saying is that it, if we live life his way, that load is going to be a lot lighter than it would be without him. His yoke enables us to keep going and not give up too quickly. In fact, his yoke, doing life his way, is so good that carrying the burden of life will actually feel more like rest. Again, that doesn't mean storms in life won't come, but what it does mean is when those storms do come, you can rest in the middle of it, just like he did in a literal sense when he was sound asleep in the boat as the storm raged on the Sea of Galilee. How to carry the burden called life has always been one of the world's biggest problems. And it's still a big problem today. 
But here Jesus is telling us how to carry it in a way that leads to our flourishing. He's saying, carry it the way that I do. Take life as I take it. Look at it from my point of view. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So what exactly is it that he's wanting us to learn? If rest is a process, if it is produced, if it flourishes in the right environment, what environment is that? What ingredients do we need in order to produce rest? Well, he tells us right there in verse 29, learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about the heart of a person. And whenever it's talking about the heart, 99% of the time it's not talking about the organ in our chest that pumps blood. When the Bible talks about the heart of a person, he's talking about the very center of who we are. The heart of a person is, is, is what makes us tick. It's what motivates us, what makes us get out of bed every morning. And so the next point there, the heart is what defines and directs us. The heart of a person is what defines and directs us. That's why Solomon so wisely said in Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Charles Spurgeon pointed out that in all four of the Gospels, 89 chapters of biblical text, this is the only place here that Jesus talks about his own heart. There's a lot that we learn about Jesus in all four of the Gospels. But this right here may be the most important thing to know about him. It's the only place where he opens up to us his heart, telling us the center of who he is. He's gentle and humble. Other translations say gentle and lowly, which is actually a better translation. So I'm just going to go with that one this morning. For Jesus to say that he is gentle doesn't mean that he is just this effeminate sissy. No, he was the ultimate man's man. But to say that he was gentle at heart means that he is not waiting around for us to mess up so that he can knock us upside the head and get us back in line. You know, I hear people say things like that all the time. You know, they'll feel convicted about a message or something and say, oh, man, Pastor Jason, boy, Jesus really hit me right between the eyes with a two-by-four this morning. No, he didn't. That is not who he is. He's gentle. Which means, there in your notes, for him to be gentle at heart means he's not harsh. Means he's not easily frustrated. Means he's not impatient every time that you and I get it wrong. When we fall and get it wrong, he is none of those things which means he is the most graceful and understanding person in the whole universe. Listen, y'all, every time we fail, every time we fall in sin, Jesus' posture toward us is not one of a pointed finger. His posture is one of open arms, saying, come to me. He's gentle at heart. The other word he used to describe who he is is lowly. The Greek word used there is it's not describing someone's uh, characteristic, their attitude or virtue, as in he's a real humble guy, although being humble is an element of it. Paul uses the same word in Romans 12, 16, when he said, do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. That means don't think for a second that you are better than anyone else, that anyone else is beneath you. Identify with those who are the socially unimpressive, the outcast, the ones that are different from everyone else. He's saying, don't identify with those who are always the life of the party. You identify with those who everyone rolls their eyes at when they show up to the party. It's being lowly. This is how Jesus describes the core of who he is. These aren't just two characteristics of Jesus. This is who he is. A lowly, it means he's humble. It means not thinking you're better than others. It means dead to self. That's lowly. Jesus emptied himself. 
taking the form of a bond servant all the way to the cross. One of the things this means is that he is accessible with all his power and majesty and resplendent glory. Even though all authority has been given to him in heaven and earth and he sits at the right hand of the Father ruling and reigning over his kingdom, he is the most accessible and approachable person in the whole universe. Which means there are no prerequisites to come to him. No requirements, no hoops that we have to jump through first or qualifications that we have to meet. In fact, he tells us there who can come to him, all who are weary and heavy laden. Not those who have it all together, not those who have memorized the most Bible verses or go to church the most, but those who are weary and heavy laden, those who don't have it all together are the ones who can come. And I would say there really is just one requirement for us to come to Jesus. The only thing that you need to have to come to him is need. Need. Whatever that need is, it qualifies you to come because he delights in meeting every one of them. He's gentle and lowly. Of course, this is the exact opposite of what religion says. Religion says you've got to clean yourself up. You've got to get your act together first in order to come to Jesus. But the gospel says, no, you come just as you are. No matter how messed up and broken that might be, Jesus will meet you right there because he's gentle and lowly. So what does all that have to do with us finding and learning rest? Everything. Everything. I mean, notice the connection there. He says, learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart. The word for is connecting learning with gentle and lowly. How to be gentle and lowly is what we are learning from Jesus. Gentle and lowly is the yoke that we are putting on that lessens the burden of life. Gentle and lowly are the ingredients for rest. It is the environment in which rest flourishes. I mean, think about it. What is the chief cause of unrest? Where does our restlessness come from? What produces stress? It's not money or work or people or situations or anything like that. Those are not the root causes of stress. Those are just things that triggers the stress that's already there. What is the root cause of stress? You ready? Self. Self. It's the next point there. Self is the root cause of all stress. Thinking too much about ourselves is what ultimately causes stress in our lives. We stress about money. Why? Because we're worried about not having enough is going to affect what we're able to do, things that we want to do, how it's going to disrupt my comfort. A lot of our stress comes from being so worried about what others think of me. We stress, what are people going to think of me? What are they going to say about me? How are they going to treat me? We stress about our own safety. What's going to happen to me? How safe am I going to be? No matter how you slice it, it all boils down to a focus on self. I mean, think about patience. Let me talk about patience for a minute because being impatient is a form of stress. It it causes a lot of stress in our lives. And I hear people say all the time, I need more patience. It's one of the top requests I hear from people when you say, what What can I pray for you about? Just pray that God will give me more patience. But here's the deal. If you are in Christ, if you are a born-again believer, you already have all the patience you're ever going to get and ever going to need. Why? Because patience is part of the fruit of the Spirit. And if you have the Spirit of Jesus living inside of you, you have His patience. You don't need more patience, you just need less self. Because self is getting in the way of you being able to walk in the patience that he has given to you by his spirit. 
I mean, why do we get impatient? Because something is affecting my plans. If I'm impatient, it means I'm frustrated because I'm not getting what I want the moment I want it. Impatience is a symptom of self-centeredness. So quit praying that God will give you more patience and pray that you will learn to die to self. Pray Philippians 2, 3, and 4 that with humility of mind, I might regard others as more important than myself. Pray that I will not look out for my own interests, but more for the interest of others. Do that, and you'll be able to walk in a lot more patience and a lot less stress. But self is the root cause of all stress. And what is the antidote of being self-centered? Being gentle and lowly. Henry Drummond was an evangelist, Bible scholar back in the 1800s. And he talked about this in a book that he wrote called The Greatest Thing in the World. It's a great title. <clears throat> I want to read you some of what he wrote about this. He said, Wounded vanity, disappointed hopes, unsatisfied selfishness, which is just not getting your way, said these are the old, vulgar, universal sources of man's unrest. The life of Jesus is a fine inoculation, a transfusion of healthy blood to anemic or poisoned soul. No fever can attack a perfectly sound body. No fever of unrest can disturb a soul which has breathed the air or learned the ways of Christ. Men long for wings of a dove that they may fly away to find rest, but flying away will not help us. We aspire to the top to look for rest, but it lies at the bottom. Water rests only when it gets to the lowest place. So do men. Hence, be lowly. The man who has no opinion of himself at all can never be hurt when others disparage or don't even acknowledge him. Did you hear that? I'm going to say that again. The man or woman who has no opinion of himself at all can never be hurt when others disparage or don't even acknowledge him. The gentle man and the lowly man are really above all other men, above all other things. They dominate the world because they do not care for it. Whoa. I love that last line so much so that I included it as the last thing in the notes there. Those who are gentle and lowly dominate the world because they do not care for it. If the load of life that you are carrying seems heavy, think about this. What causes heaviness in a physics sense? It's gravity, right? And what is gravity? The attraction of earth. Remove the attraction of earth and everything becomes light. The more you are attracted to and focused on the things of the earth, your own self-preservation, self-promotion, self-reputation, the heavier the stress is going to be. The only way to find true rest is to be free from self and the attraction of the world. That's why Paul said in Colossians 2, 2 and 3, or 3, 2 and 3, he said, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on, on the earth. And here's the key, for you have... Christ in God. If you are in Christ, you have died. The old you died. And you have been born again to a new life, a life that can be shared, the very life of Jesus himself. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. So live like it. You know, I was thinking about this as I was preparing this message. You know what some of the most peaceful and restful places in the world are? Cemeteries. Think that's just a coincidence? No, it's cause and effect. There's no stress there because the people are dead there. I think we as Christians could learn a lot from the dead. And what it means for our old self to be dead in Christ but some of us like that song says we're still tending the grave 
We're still trying to bring that dead self up, playing weekend at Bernie's with it like it's still alive. (laughs) No, it's dead. Leave it alone. Walk away from it. Die to self. When you're dead, you can't be any more humble and lowly than that. So are you weary and heavy laden? Are you stressed and full of anxiety? Then come to Jesus. Quit turning to everything else and turn to Jesus. Take his yoke, his way of living upon you. Learn from him. Learn to live as someone who has emptied themselves, someone who has died. Learn how to live as gentle and lowly the way that he did. And again, God did not design or equip us to learn this by ourselves, to learn it on our own. We learn these things best in the context of community. It's learning how to live this way, how to be humble and lowly and gentle with other believers. It's what Jesus designed us for. And so do that. Learn that together, and you will Find rest for your soul. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, every time I open up your word, it just seems I'm more amazed and more grateful of just seeing how you have just not left us on our own to figure things out. But Lord, you give us the way the right way, the only way, every time. It's just this display of your love that you want to see us flourish and not flounder. So Lord, I pray right now for others will see that.